Thank you. It's a, an honor to be here. Uh, I've never actually even been to Oxford before, let alone spoken here. And uh, needless to say, it's a great honor to be on the stage with uh, my friend and colleague and actually one of my intellectual heroes, Richard Dawkins. So as many of you know, we have spent the last several years publicly criticizing religion. And I can tell you that what you, you hear back when you do that are all the reasons why most people think that's a terrible thing to do. And the reasons are not so numerous. It turns out there's not a hundred ways or reasons to rise to the defense of God. There really are only three. Either you argue that a specific religion is true, or you argue religion is useful in general, or you argue that atheism is, is intolerant or in bad taste or, or corrosive of something that's important in human life. And it's interesting that people rarely argue for the truth of religion, even fundamentalists, I find. Fundamentalists uh, almost never come forward with evidence for miracles or the confirmation of biblical prophecy. Some do, but for the most part, that's not even their primary concern. Rather, it's, it's the usefulness of religion, especially as a, a framework in which to think about morality, uh, that people uh, uh, are... Uh, willing to advocate for, uh, and the commensurate danger of, of atheism, that atheism is somehow corrosive of, of morality. Uh, now, the first thing to notice is that as, a, as an argument for belief in God, that is it's not only a bad argument, that's actually a, a non sequitur. I mean, religion could be useful, but completely empty of, of uh, content. Uh, it could function like a placebo. Uh, and beliefs, really, you can't, you can't believe something or shouldn't be able to believe something merely based on its utility. Uh, beliefs are not like clothing. You can't adopt them on the basis of, of uh, comfort or utility. Uh, but people of faith, uh, really to a man, are worried that unless we have a, a universal moral framework, unless we have a sense that words like good and evil and right and wrong actually mean something, then humanity will, will lose its way. And I, and I actually share that fear. Uh, and I should point out that not all atheists do, but I, I, I do. And I, I, I want to tell you when this, this concern was first seared onto my brain. I was at a, um, a meeting at the Salk Institute. I believe it might have been one that Richard w was at as well. Uh, and I gave a talk about morality, and I, and I argued, as I, I will uh, here tonight, that morality must relate at some level, to questions of human and animal well-being. And the moment we admit this, we can see that certain moral codes are, in fact, worse than others. Uh, and I cited as an example the misogyny and sadism of the Taliban as, as an example of a, a, an orientation that was obviously less good than others. And at the end, a, another invited speaker approached me and said, how could you ever say, from the point of view of science, that forcing women to wear burqas is wrong. And I said, well, because the moment you admit right and wrong has something to do with, with human well-being, then it's obvious that, that forcing half the population to live in cloth bags and beating them or killing them when they try to get out is, is not a, a good way of maximizing it. And she said, well, well, that's just your opinion. And I said, okay, well, let's make it easier. Let's say we found a culture that was removing the eyeballs of children every third child, say. Would, would, you, would you then agree that we'd found a culture that was not perfectly maximizing human well-being? And she said, well, it would depend on why they were doing it. Uh, and uh, so af after my eyebrows returned from the back of my head, uh, I said, okay, let's say they're doing it for religious reasons. Let's say they have a scripture which says every third should walk in darkness, or some such nonsense. And she said, well, then you could never say that they were wrong. Now, you should know that I was speaking to a woman who was uh, quite a uh, sophisticated student of philosophy and science. In fact, she, she has since been appointed to the President's Council on Bioethics in the United States. She's one of 13 people advising President Obama on all of the ethical implications of, of medicine. Uh, and progress in, in related science and technology. Uh, 
And she had just delivered a perfectly lucid lecture on the moral implications of advances in neuroscience. And she was especially concerned that we might be subjecting captured terrorists to fMRI-based lie detection technology. And she thought, she, she thought this would be a, a, a truly unconscionable violation of their, their cognitive liberty. Uh, so on the one hand, her, her moral scruples were really finely calibrated to, to recoil from the slightest perceived misstep in our uh, war on terror. And yet she was totally detached from the very real suffering of millions of women in Afghanistan at this moment. So I view this double standard as a problem. And strangely, this is the erosion of basic common sense and moral goodness that religious people tend to be worried about. Uh, now, I, I hope it's obvious to all of you and will be even more obvious at the end of this hour that, that religion isn't the answer to this problem. Uh, but um, it's inconvenient that the people who tend to uh, agree with me about the necessity of a concept of moral truth are, by and large, religious demagogues and not our fellow secularists, uh, and certainly not our uh, uh, atheists. So now how do we find ourselves into this, in this situation? How, do we, how is it that, that religious dogmatists and many, many scientifically orient, oriented uh, secularists agree about the limits of science? Well, it's thought that there, there are two quantities in this world. There are facts on the one hand, and there are values on the other. Uh, and it's imagined that these two are, di are discrete entities that, that can't be understood uh, uh, in monistic terms. And uh, it's imagined that science can't say anything about value. Science can't tell us uh, the answers to the most important questions in human life. How should we raise our children? What constitutes a good life? Uh, in principle, science can't touch these things. Uh, of course, everyone agrees that science can help us get what we value. I mean, once we agree that we value something, then science is a very useful tool. Uh, but it, can, it can't tell us what we ought to value. Uh, and so it's, it's thought from the, the point of view of science that when we look at the universe, we just see one event following another. We just see uh, a concatenation of causes. And there's no corner of the universe that, that announces certain events as good or bad or right or wrong. Uh, we make those judgments. But in, in doing that, we seem to be broadcasting our preferences onto a, a reality that is intrinsically value-free. And where do our preferences come from? Where do our notions of right and wrong and, and good and evil come from? Well, they, they clearly are the product of apish impulses and social emotions that have been drummed into us by evolution. And then they get modulated by culture. So you take something like sexual jealousy, for instance. Uh, we, we come from a long line of, of primate ancestors that were probably quite covetous of one another, uh, despite the fact that everyone was covered with hair. Uh, and this, gets, this, this possessiveness gets modulated by culture, and so we have something like the institution of marriage, say. Uh, and therefore, from the point of view of science, when you look at a statement like, it's wrong to cheat on your spouse, it seems like that statement doesn't really track reality in any deep sense. There's nothing, this is just how apes like us learn to, to worry when we, when we acquire language. Uh, it's just conventionally wrong. It can't be really wrong from the point of view of science. This is just an, an improvisation we're, we're doing on the back of biology. Uh, now, this is where religious people begin to get a little queasy and, and I think they should. Uh, but they see no alternative, by and large, but to insert the God of Abraham into the clockwork as an invisible arbiter of moral truth. So, it, so it's wrong to cheat on your spouse because Yahweh deems that it is so, which is rather odd because in other moods, Yahweh is fond of genocide and slavery and, and human sacrifice. Now, I'm going to argue that this split between facts and values is an illusion. And my claim is that, that values are a certain kind of fact. They're facts about the well-being of conscious creatures. They're facts about the, the kinds of experiences it's possible to have in this universe. Now, in, in claiming that value is reduced to the well-being of conscious creatures, I've been, I'm introducing two concepts, consciousness and well-being. Let's start with consciousness. This, this 
to my eye, is not at all an arbitrary starting point. Okay, imagine a universe without the possibility of consciousness. Imagine a universe just filled with rocks. Okay, there's, there's nothing that it's like to be in this universe. Okay, the lights are not on in this universe. There's clearly no happiness or suffering. I would argue there's, the, the concept of right and wrong, good and evil, simply doesn't apply. For, for changes in the universe to matter, they have to matter at least potentially to some conscious system. Now, what about well-being? The, the, it seems like the well-being of conscious creatures could be a, a controversial anchor for morality, but I don't think it should. Okay, here, here's the only assumption you need to make. Imagine a universe where, where every conscious creature suffers as much as it possibly can for as long as it can. I call this the worst possible misery for everyone. The worst possible misery for everyone is bad. If the word bad is going to mean anything, surely it applies to the worst possible misery for everyone. Now, if you think the worst possible misery for everyone isn't bad, or that it might have a silver lining, or it, there might be something worse, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and what is more, I'm reasonably sure you don't know what you're talking about either. The moment you admit this, the moment you admit that the worst possible misery for everyone is the worst outcome, okay, then you have to admit that every other possible experience is better than the worst possible misery for everyone. So a continuum opens up. And because the experience of conscious creatures is going to depend in some way on the laws of nature, there are going to be right and wrong ways to move across this continuum. It will be possible to think you're avoiding the worst possible misery for everyone and to be wrong about that and to fail to avoid it. This is, in some sense, a navigation problem. Uh, so here is my argument for, for locating moral truth in the context of science. Questions of right and wrong and good and evil depend upon minds. They depend upon the possibility of experience. Minds are natural phenomena. They, de they depend upon the laws of nature in some way. Morality and human values, therefore, can be understood potentially in the context of science because in talking about these things, we really are talking about all of the facts that relate to the well-being of conscious creatures. In our case, we're talking about genetics and neurobiology and psychology and sociology and economics. Now, I, I view this space of all possible experience as a kind of moral landscape where the peaks correspond to the heights of well-being and the valleys correspond to the lowest depths of suffering. And one thing that to, to, to drop out of this analogy is the possibility of there being multiple peaks. Maybe there are, are many different but morally equivalent ways for, for, in our case, human beings to thrive. But clearly there are many more ways not to thrive. There will be many more ways to not be on a peak. And I think it's rather obvious that there are many more ways to suffer unnecessarily in this world than to be sublimely happy. 